Once the Messenger وسلم, along with a group of his Sahaba, his companions, were returning from an expedition. They had gone up for a battle and then they were returning back home. So remember this would take many days to get back home. And most of it was just by foot. So as they are, tra as they are traveling, they are overcome with tiredness and so they decided to take a small break. Try to take a rest. So the Prophet وسلم, this is a sunnah by the way, it's like a midday nap. Not like for five hours, but just for a short nap. So Nabi Alaihi takes a siesta. And he sleeps underneath a tree and his companions are sleeping around him. Before he does so, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he takes his sword and he hangs it over a branch on the tree. And then he lays down to Allah and he goes to sleep. As the Sahaba are there and everyone is sleeping, a man sneaks into the camp. No one is aware, he's undetected. He comes in, comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knows who he is Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he grabs the sword and he unsheathes it. And the Nabi Wasallam wakes up and he sees the man standing over him. With the sword in his hand pointed at him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he stands up the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he addresses the man. So the man asks him a question. The first question he asks him is, Atakhafuni? The man asks him, Are you afraid of me? What do you think your Prophet's response is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? La. Looks him right in the eyes, dead in the eyes. No. Imagine like, the courage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the bravery. In today's parlance, it would be like looking down the barrel of a loaded gun. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at him straight and says, No. And so the man obviously, you know, has a question that immediately comes to mind. Why isn't he afraid? Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he asks him, Mayyam na'uka minni. Who will defend you from me right now? Like, why aren't you afraid? I have a knife right here, a sword right in front of your face, and you're not afraid? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what do you think his response is? He doesn't say, hey man, try me. I'm the Prophet of God, try me, see what happens. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that, why don't you look around? We've got hundreds of companions here. You try anything, see what they do to you. He doesn't say that either. What is his response to Allah? He said, Who will defend you? Who will protect you? He said, Allah. That's it. The moment he says the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the man's sword drops from his hand. Look at the conviction the Prophet had just in that one word. The strength of the Prophet's faith and his iman, his yaqeen, his certainty. That if Allah wanted subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could suspend cause and effect right there. This guy's got a sword in his hand, Allah can turn it into a drop of water right then and there. And so the man drops the sword. The Prophet ﷺ reaches over and he grabs it. The man is paralyzed. He can't move. He can't move. The Prophet ﷺ grows. He, he grabs the sword and he points it at the man now. And he says to him the same thing. Okay, who is going to protect you from me now? Well, the man is like, what do you think he's going to say, right? He has no one around him to defend himself. No one around him. So he looks at the Prophet ﷺ and he ignores the question. He ignores the question. He says something totally irrelevant. He says, Kun khayra akhidin. Listen, like, just be the better of the two guys. You know, be the better of both of us. Like, please. And so the Prophet looks at him and he says, Okay. He doesn't strike him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he asks him a question. He says, Atashidu an la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah. He gives him da'wah. He says, Do you bear witness that Allah is the only one worthy of worship and I am the messenger of God? What do you think the man's response is? No. And he says, no, the guy doesn't accept Islam. He's like, la. Now you think, man, oh, this is, you know, this is the prophet of war, right? He should be striking the guy down right now. What does the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam do? He looks at him. He says, okay. The man says, walakin, however, however. Okay, I won't accept Islam. However, I'll tell you one thing. Walakin ni uahiduk. Anni la uqatiluk. Wala akunu fi qawmin yuqatilunak. I will never fight you. I will never wage war against you. Nor will I ever support any group of people that ever fights against you. I promise. You have my word. And the Prophet ﷺ takes him at his word. And he says, okay, no problem. He lets him go home. The man goes back to his people. And he, he comes to them and he says, man, you're not going to believe this. What happened? He said, I have come to you from the presence of the greatest human being I've ever met. In this hadith, there's so much to be taken and so much to be learned. But Wallahi, we'll two things. Number one, you see how to behave, how to act when you are in a position of supposed inferiority, when someone else has power over you, when you feel like, man, what am I going to do? And then, on the flip side, when the power comes into your hands, what do you th do then? How do you deal with it? And not just with any other person, but the same one who was threatening you, who made you feel inferior and ostensibly weaker. How do you deal with that person? Our Prophet ﷺ showed us exactly. And today, in light of everything that is happening, we have to think, how can we bring that into our own heart? Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't look at the means, he didn't look at the asbab, he didn't look at the world around him. He looked beyond that which is Allah. He says, yeah, I have a lot of strength, I have a lot of power, but at the end of the day, that's nothing. 
yeah, my companions are here, but at the end of the day, that's nothing. What can they do? It's only Allah who can do anything and everything. And when we see what is happening in the world today, especially in Gaza and Palestine, this is a reminder for ourselves. That it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can do anything and everything. And that whatever means that you and I have, at the end of the day, Allah will only ask us what we did with those things. You know, there is an ayah of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَنْصُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Allah will help those who help him. So I remember, you know, there's a hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet وسلم, in which he says, كُنْتُ خَلْفَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَوْمًا One day I was sitting on a conveyance with the Prophet وسلم, So he, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is in the front seat, I'm in the back seat. And he says, يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أُعَلِّمُكَ كَلِمَاتِ He says that my son, and though they were cousins, he was very, very, very young compared to the Prophet وسلم, So he addressed him as he would a child. He said, I will teach you something. So what is he going to teach him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? اِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ يَحْفَذْكَ اِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ تَجِدْهُ تُجَاهَكَ he says that protect Allah, Allah will protect you. Protect Allah, wherever you look, wherever you turn, Allah will be in front of you. So I read this hadith, it's from one of the first hadith that I learned. I asked my teacher, and I was like, man, this got my, you know, I'm scratching my beard over here trying to figure this out. What does this mean? And so then he told me. He says, this doesn't mean you protect Allah. Allah, wallahu khayran hafidhan. Allah is your best protector. Allah is your helper. It means that you protect the deen of Islam. And you help the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what it means. الَّذِينَ إِمَّا كَنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفَ وَنَهُوا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Those people, when Allah takes care of all of your needs, and you know, even the children here today, Allah has taken care of all of our needs, وَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ If you have food in your stomach, and you have clothes on your back, and you have a roof over your head, we are in this ayah. That Allah has given you a place. Allah has taken care of all of our needs. So now He will ask, what did you do with it after I took care of all of these things? Especially in light of recent events, we can see people who don't have any of these things nor clothes on their back, nor food in their stomach, or a roof over their heads. But for us, Allah SWT will ask us, Did you do what I told you to do? Which is what? Number one, aqamu salah you establish the prayer. It's not just establishing prayer as in, oh, they prayed sometimes. It's not just praying sometimes. It is making it a consistent part of your life. Why? Because it connects you to Allah. So that every single thing you do in your life, whatever it might be, you do it for the right reason. You do it for the right reason. That's why we pray five times a day. Exactly five. Why? It's a constant reminder. That I'm going to work, why? I'm going to school, why? I'm doing this, why? I'm not doing this, why? All of that is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, I tell zakat, these people, they give charity. What is money today, by the way? Money is basically an exchange of your life. That's all it is. You give a part of your life, a part of your time and your effort and worry, and you get a little bit of money in return. And so if you sincerely care about any cause, any person, then you give a part of your life to that person in the form of charity. And this is one of the wisdoms of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows calamities to occur, be it man-made or natural. Why? So that people who have can take care of those who do not have. And so now, you and I, in positions where we do have, are we taking care of those who no longer have? Third, he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ They command one another to do good. They command the good. Every one of us has some form of platform, whatever it might be. For me, it might be standing here. For you, it might be somewhere else. Be it at work, be it at school, be it online. Whatever it is. It is your responsibility and mine to speak up for that which is true and right. You know, in the science of hadith, there is a type of hadith which is called iqrar or taqrir, which is when the Messenger وسلم, saw something happen in front of him. The Prophet saw something and someone did or said something and then he didn't stop them. He didn't stop them. Which means what? It means that he وسلم, approved of it or he didn't think that it was so bad that he should stop it. Which means that he وسلم, was okay with it. So it's not haram. It's allowed to do. Now you and I, when things happen in front of us, things happen in front of us, if we don't speak up, that is a type of approval. If you know that it's wrong, why are we speaking up? That's the question. If I know that something is wrong and I don't speak up, you know, this is like a pop quiz. That's how we should look at it. You immediately, something happens in front of you and you know that this is wrong, why don't we say anything? Allah is testing you instantly, like, okay, let me see, let me see, are you a Muslim or not? Right there. Are you going to do Amr bil ma'ruf nahi anil munkar? Are you going to command the good and forbid the evil right when it happens right in front of you? You know, I'll tell you a story to get the, the point across, okay? It's a very embarrassing story, but you know what? Sometimes it's necessary. I remember back in college, once I was sitting in a lecture. I'm sitting in the lecture and the teacher is bringing up some kind of random topic. And a person, a few rows ahead of me, he says, Oh yeah, like how Islam oppresses women and subjugates women, you know? And he says this, and the teacher immediately butts in. He's like, uh, okay, yeah, so let's uh, change the topic. And I'm sitting several rows back, and I felt... A type of anger, as you rightfully should. A person is insulting your deen, and a person is insulting Muslim women, as if they have no agency of their own. So I heard this, and I got really upset. And I was going to say something, but I didn't. 
And now this has been years. It's been years and I still feel ashamed. And I'm like, man, that was my pop quiz. Allah tested me at that moment right there. Am I going to speak up and say something in defense of Islam? And to be honest, I got an F. I should have said something. And now every time I remember this and I think, I'm not going to let that happen again. And in today's day and age, when we see what is happening to our brothers and sisters, and people are making it literally illegal to even use the words pro-Palestine or free Palestine, or to say you stand in support of Palestine, a place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected for the believers, just as sacred as Mecca and Medina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected Palestine. He has selected Jerusalem. He has selected that entire area. That place. That we are not speaking up in defense of it. This is our obligation. Do it with wisdom. Use your platform with wisdom. Howsoever it might be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us that help that He has promised. You want help in your personal life. Forget on an ummatic scale. Obviously, we should be worrying about the global ummah. But people sometimes, you know, you tell them that if you do this, Allah will help you in your personal affairs. The thing that you are dealing with that you really want taken care of, take care of other people. Wallahi, Allah will take care of you. That's it. Take care of other people and Allah will take care of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to do this and increase us in our yaqeen, in our certainty, in His words. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أما بعد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا From the greatest of Islamic you know uh, academics and intellectuals that have ever graced this earth is Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i رحمه الله الإمام الشافعي رحمه الله and he was born a few gener a couple generations after the Prophet ﷺ, and he was born in the city of Gaza. Today the Shafi'i Madhab is built upon him. The Shafi'i Madhab is built upon him. And he was an illustrious and eminent scholar. He was an absolute polymath, and he was a genius of the highest caliber and degree. So he excelled in every field, including in the field of poetry. So he had a few lines of poetry, and I thought, you know, why don't we share them, especially in light of what's going on? Because every time you turn on the news, you open your phone, whatever you see, it just fills you with all kinds of emotions. And so he says, Rahimahullah, Sahirat uyunun wa namat a'yunu, fi umurin takunu aw la takunu, fadra il hamma mastata'ata, fa inna himlanuka al humuma jununu, inna rabban kafaka bil ams, ma kana siyakfika fi ghadin ma yakunu. He says, Rahimahullah. He says, and this is, again, it's an explanation. He says, some people, they can't sleep all night. They're up every single night, they take pill after pill after pill after pill, and they can't fall asleep. Meanwhile, other people never want to get out of bed. Why? He says, because these people are worried about if. The word if. If, 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 if. What if this happens? What if that happens? Hypothetical after hypothetical. And they are so plagued with worries and anxieties, they can't face the world, they can't face life. So after he makes his observation, he says, that you know, try and leave off as much of these worries as you can. Because if you're going to keep carrying these worries, all these possibilities and hypotheticals, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Is what he says. Now, you might say, Imam, that's, that's wonderful advice, but it's a lot easier said than done, right? Oh, just stop worrying. So he gives us a reminder why you should stop worrying. He says, Inna Rabban kafaka bil ams. Ma kana siyakfika fi ghadan ma yakunu. The same Allah who took care of you yesterday, do you think He's going to abandon you tomorrow? You didn't get where you are today, magically. You didn't become 30, 40, 50 years old with a house and a car and a family and, and a job by yourself magically. Allah took care of you every single day of your life until you got to where you are. So do you think that same Allah is going to abandon you? The answer is absolutely not. We have to remind ourselves of that constantly. Allah took care of me at my lowest point, at my difficult point, most difficult point in my life. That same Allah will help me through. The same Allah that helped Muhammad when he was there in Khandaq and the Ahzab are in front of him, the armies, 10,000 people stronger in front of him. They haven't eaten for four weeks. Allah took care of him, didn't he? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of Musa salam when he's walking through the ocean and the, the rivers, are, the, the water is there, a mountain high. Allah took care of Musa, didn't he? Allah took care of, of, of Ibrahim when he, threw, when he was thrown into the fire. He took care of him. He took care of Yusuf when he's left at the bottom of a well. Allah SWT took care of each and every single one of these prophets. And he will use any and every means that he wishes. Allah SWT divinely lifted Jesus to the heavens. Where? Right now. Where they are bombing right now, in that same place, Allah SWT lifted Isa alayhi salam, Jesus to the heavens. So Allah took care of them. Don't think that Allah will not take care of you. And don't think that Allah will not take care of them. Those people who are there still today. And so when we see these things, you know, in these moments, of darkness and confusion, moments of, what is it, manufactured consent, that's what it is, or moments of, uh, 
you know, disinformation and misinformation. Moments of atrocity propaganda. It's darkness after darkness. How do we perceive? How do we look? See beyond all of this. Look at the light of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The light of the Qur'an and the words of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us how we should look at our brothers and sisters. And sometimes it can become desensitizing to see video after picture after video. And it really gets you down. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us how we should look at it. What does he say? وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا You know today when a person passes away they're just another tally added to the death toll, added to the death count. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says stop counting. Literally says stop counting. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ Hisab means counting. Don't count them amongst the dead. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا Those who have been killed فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا They're not dead. بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ They are alive with their Lord. We believe each and every one of them is alive with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And not only that, but today they are being starved and they are being, you know, the electricity has been cut. All of these things they are going through. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Allah is taking care of them. This is our faith. This is our aqidah. This is our belief. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken care of our brother, brothers and sisters, be they in Palestine and in Gaza, or those who have passed away in Afghanistan, or those who have passed away in Morocco, and many other places in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken that affair upon Himself. He will deal with it. So this should be a moment of happiness. As sad as we are to see this, we know that Allah is rewarding them in ways that we could never give it to them. In ways we could never do. And then finally, I want to make a little point of aqidah. Okay, it's a little small aqidah lesson. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aqidah to ahli sunnati wal jama'ah. This is the belief of every single Muslim, and as it should be. That each and every Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alive in his grave. Each and every Prophet of Allah is alive in their graves. Right? And so, how is, how is it that we should look at those brothers and sisters of ours who are going through a great struggle, who are going through a great difficulty right now, at this very moment as I give this khutbah? Can you imagine? At this very moment, as you are listening to me here, how should we look at them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fala Do not think that Allah will break the promise that He made to His messengers. Don't ever think that Allah will break that promise He made to His prophets. So what is that promise Allah made to them? What does He say subhanahu wa ta'ala? رُسُلَنَا وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We will help, we will assist, give victory to our prophets and those who have believed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this with absolute emphasis. And those prophets, now why did I make that point of aqidah? Because those prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are alive in their graves. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which he specifically says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ أَجْسَادَ الْأَنْبِيَا that Allah has made it a haram for the earth to decompose or decay the bodies of the prophets. They are alive in their graves. The Prophet ﷺ, Isra in Mi'raj, when he went from Mecca to Jerusalem, the only time he went there, when he went, he says, Marartu bi qabri Musa, and al Qatib al Ahmar. I passed by Musa and he was praying at the red sand where his grave is in the red sand dune. And I saw him in his grave. Qa'imun yusalli. Musa is praying in body and in soul, in his grave. And the Prophet ﷺ, there on the Aqsa compound. Where today, they limited uh, the access to it, so there was only a very few amount, small amount of people who were able to pray Jum'ah there today. That same place, our Prophet ﷺ was there. And he led over 100,000 Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Salah. Can you imagine? There's only one place on earth where every Prophet of Allah was gathered. Only one. Not in Mecca, not in Medina. Nowhere else but in Jerusalem. Allah gathered each and every single Prophet there. And they prayed behind our Messenger wasallam. Imagine how sacred and blessed that land is. That every Prophet of Allah stood there and they all prayed there. And not only that, but today, how many of them are buried there today? There's a place there in Jerusalem, it's called Khalil. It's named after Khalilullah Ibrahim alayhi salam, the friend of Allah. And that place is today where it's, being, it's under constant you know, bombardment, cluster munitions, white phosphorus. It's being used on innocent men, women, and children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically says, that, inna la, inna la rusulana wal-ladheena amanu fil hayati dunya We will help the, the prophets and the believers. وَيَوْمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْأَشْهَادِ And the day when all the witnesses will be made to stand. So who are the witnesses? If not the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will bring them all in testimony and say, Okay, you tell me what happened. We talk about other side of the story. And in today's day and age, unfortunately, it's just one side that is being plastered all over the news. We only see one side. Don't worry, Allah will have a day subhanahu wa ta'ala when we will hear the other side. And the Prophet of Allah will be the witnesses and they will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, when you come to my grave and you say salam to me, I will respond to your salam. The Prophets are alive and they know exactly what happens around them in their midst. And so the Prophets of Allah in their graves, in Jerusalem, in Gaza, in Palestine, all these areas, they know exactly what is happening. And they will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell him in explicit detail exactly what happened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there. No excuse will suffice for the person who has committed dhulm and oppression in the world. No excuse will be enough. So as sad as it is, 
and as upsetting as it is to see this, we have to remind ourselves, in light of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. He is in control. The bombs may be over our brothers and sisters, but Allah is over that. Allah is in total control, in absolute control. And justice will be meted out one day by Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in our yaqeen, in our certainty of His words and the words of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana fi Palestine. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana fi Gaza. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana al mustadafina fi sa'ir bilad al muslimin. اللهم عليك بأعدائهم وأعدائك اللهم إنا نجعلك في نحورهم ونعوذ بك من شرورهم اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمركم بالعدل والإحسان وإذا إذا القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والباغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم ولذكر الله تعالى هو الأكبر قوموا للصلاة